I've been doing it a long time. My name is Jerry Hughes. Uh, my colleague Pat's on as well. Uh, we're going to move through the next hour or so and kind of cover some of the key points uh, for uh, risk assessments and audits and the difference between the two. So we've got on our agenda, as you can see, we're going to cover some of the terminology, you know, in this field, as well as many other fields, acronyms are everywhere. In fact, often we use them as, as words themselves. And so I'm hoping today between myself and Pat to kind of break through some of that, explain them, use them in examples, and then get, get into the nitty gritty of the risk assessing process and auditing and, and some of the other uh, terms that are used and misused out there. And then we're gonna cover uh, some uh, specifics about controls, which is a key facet uh, in any organization. And then lack of controls or control weaknesses. We're gonna cover a little bit about that. Uh, and then we'll dive deeper into that terminology and really talk through the different uh, facets uh, of audits and different types of audits and, and that kind of thing, as well as assessments. And then we'll summarize and bring it all home and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take on those questions. So please fire those over to Rob. Uh, it's listed as the host, I think, when you look at the chat. And uh, he'll capture those and, and we'll move through that, okay? <clears throat> so there's, there's some of the terms. And, I, and I'll bet there's even more that you probably can think of. We look at this thing we've got, yeah, on the front page of this presentation, we mentioned you know IT audit and IT risk assessment. But there's also this I've heard the term health check before. I don't know if any of you folks have, or a gap analysis. A lot of folks love that one. And, and, and uh, a review, what, what, what's a review, right? And then a self-assessment. Well, that's kind of, uh, kind of explains itself. But I mean, there's just so many different ones and I'll bet there's a few more and I've, I've come across them. And at the end of the day, it, you know, for us, uh, it boils down to looking at the methodology employed. You know, was there a level of independence? You know, what was looked at and that kind of thing. And then we can, uh, you know, get some value out of what was performed. Yeah, and, and great point there, Jerry. And, and with all of these different terms you see here, there you know, there's some subtle differences between between all of them, but there's obviously a lot of carryover as well, and that's important to note. And they all have you know their own unique use, right? And there's times to do risk assessments, there's time to times to do audits, and then you know those self assessments and whatnot. And uh, we'll kind of talk about some of the similarities and differences between all of these uh, throughout the slideshow today. However, before we jump into those terms and the different types of assessments or audits uh, from the previous slide, we got to go and take first things first. We got to break down some of the terms, let you understand what they, what they mean, how they work together. And then I think once we get through the next few slides, you'll get a better understanding of the building blocks or the pieces involved and how that all works together. And then when we get to the point where we are speaking uh, to uh, the specific type of audit or assessment, it will make complete sense. So first things first, right? The obvious one I mentioned earlier, which was, uh, you know, control. So what is an information technology control, an IT control? And we're gonna just, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm not gonna just say, uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna keep saying IT control. Likewise, I won't always say IT audit. This presentation, you know, we are not financial auditors we can certainly audit financial systems and all systems. However, this is not a, uh, a financial audit. This is an IT audit, information technology audit to assess an environment and, and to look at the controls in place. So anyway, these controls are specific activities performed by persons or systems designed to ensure that business objectives are met. They are a subset of an enterprise's internal control. So it's set a lot there, but within, in, in an environment or anybody's environment, they've got a number of these controls, things as simplistic as controls that protect access to a facility. Maybe it's a, a door lock, maybe it's a guard, a uh, receptionist desk. These are controls and these things are listed in, in certain places within the organization. They take the written word, uh, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but, but controls are these activities that are performed to protect the environment. And then you look at you know, where, they, where they're found and they are typically found in policies. Sometimes they're in procedures and then other related documents like checklists sometimes might even look at a, a network diagram as a control, right? It will list potentially some of the controls in, in the environment such as firewalls and other infrastructure that, that presents or prevents access that's unauthorized from the outside. So, so, so a, con a control can take a lot of forms, but 90% of them or 95% of them are, are 
in live in the policies and in an organization. So any organization, regardless of vertical, must have a solid, strong set of policies to govern the business, to protect the business. It's it's almost analogous to laws. So these policies, you know, within your industry need to speak, they certainly speak to how you're going to do your business and what's allowed and what's not allowed. They must obviously roll up to the laws and regulations that govern the industry that you're in. Um, so, so both are important when we come in and perform an audit, an IT audit, right? And these written policies and these written control statements within these policies, these are considered the design of the controls. For example, a quick example of that, um, you know, it might be something like I mentioned here, um, uh, like down below in the next bullet, kind of talk about, you know, they're found physically or logically, right? It might be a door lock. That's a physical control restricting unauthorized access to a building. In my policy, it might be written that, you know, physical controls will exist, all doors will be locked to the facility, something simplistic like that. But you can't just have a general statement, you need to have an owner to it, right? So the, you know, facilities manager will ensure that all, all doors to the facility will be locked after hours. Perfect. Now I know who's in, who owns it, the facility manager, and I know what's being done, that the doors will be locked during business, uh, after business hours, right, before and after business hours. So that is a complete control statement Perfect. I can audit it. I know what's supposed to be done. If it's not done, I can prove it. Yeah, great point there, Jerry. And, and just to kind of piggyback off of what he said, um, you know, the effectiveness of the control is just that. It's the marrying of the two together, the design and then the actual control and practice, right? So uh, to kind of piggyback off his example um, of, you know, let's say the, the policy statement is that all doors are locked after hours and then you know, someone shows up after hours and the door is, is not in fact locked, then the control is deemed not effective. So um, it's really the marrying of the two to uh, to make it be an effective control because you can have the greatest policies and the greatest uh, control statements ever, but uh, if they're not carried out in practice, then, you know, what, what good is it, right? So we're going to run into different kinds of controls too, right? So, so when I talked a little bit about the network diagram earlier, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, firewall. Well, firewall is designed as Typically, it's a piece of, of hardware that has a software layer to it that prevents unauthorized access to a network. And, and, and so that prevents access to the network. It's proactive. It's before. Whereas a detective control is, is something after, for example, a log file. So I turn a log file on all my critical systems. And if something goes sideways and I realize that there's been a compromise potentially or something's not performing properly, I will reactively look at my log files and see who, at, who logged into the system at that time or did whatever. But it's clearly after the fact. Ideally, between the two, of course, preventative controls are the ideal objective, right? Prevent it before it goes sideways. Detective, at least, well, at least we can figure out what happened, who did what, when, and where. For If we've got a nice centralized log system, we can, we can do that. And a corrective control is really a remediative one, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a remediation effort that's put in, controls that are put in after to basically address, address um, you know, a control that's not functioning properly. You know, and then you start getting into some of the other um, terms that are used. One of them you'll see a lot, and this is, um, you know, a lot of times you see this in, in more of the financial industry. We do audit work for the SEC as well as in um, the banking industry, the FFIEC, and, and they're they're very very common. You very common to see like general controls audits and application control audits. And uh, uh, this is also how uh, way back when when Sarbanes Oxy came out, this is how they they broke it down. Okay, we're gonna have auditors come in. These IT auditors are gonna look at general controls, and another IT auditor is gonna look at application controls. There's certainly a boatload of overlap, but I want to cover a couple of the the key points in here because the general controls, as it sounds, are general and pervasive throughout the organization. They'll inc include logical access controls over the applications. Okay, so there's some overlap there, uh, and the data that um, uh, and the supporting infrastructure. So, so these logical controls, uh, you know, uh, are the access controls into a particular system or into a particular device, like a firewall, maybe logging into that. So these controls. Uh, go out throughout the organization. And then when you move moving through change management, major, major uh, uh, control area, right? It, it, everything from changes to uh, infrastructure or in, uh, changes to some, some folks, it, it's kind of overlapped a little bit with the last bullet system development lifecycle controls, where there's sort of also change management, essentially 
uh, a business need is 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 uh, come upon and, and a request is made for a change, it must be authorized and approved. And then once it's approved, the change is made, verified it's good, button it down, move forward. And we have a nice clean audit trail of all of that. And quick note too, uh, terminology is everything, right? You look at the first word of that program, change management, instead of like a change management policy, the difference between a policy and a program is very simple. A policy, uh, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, sort of the do's and don'ts, the Bible of the particular business, right? And, and these policies, um, uh, you know, sort of, again, we have an owner to each policy statement and, and a task. A program is the policy. It's also the procedures that roll up to that policy. It's education on that policy. It is ongoing monitoring of that policy. So a program is much more robust, right? It includes a subset, which is the policies, but beyond that, it's procedures, monitoring, education, and it's a, it's a cyclic process ongoing. Backup recovery, major, right? Big, big controls in any environment. And when you look at uh, attempting to preempt any kind of the uh, ransomware attacks and things, having, an, having solid a solid backup program in place, you know, again, policy procedures, the whole nine, and ensuring that we're doing this properly for an organization, especially today in today's world, is paramount. Computer operations controls. This is the systems that you know often uh, uh, you know are running either on-prem or cloud-based, and and making sure that our controls uh, uh, around that system, around the updates to it, the patch management of it. There's a lot of facets uh, to that as well. And then we look at the physical places, whether it's an outsourced to a cloud provider, or we have maybe a footprint within our facilities, uh, it would, you know, where our data center is, right? There are physical controls that must be around those sensitive areas of a facility, in this case, the data center where, you know, racks may be stored and infrastructure stored uh, uh, that resides rather that uh, your most important information may be stored or flow through. Then you move through the last one, SDLC, system development lifecycle controls, this is a big one, and this, this one has a, an overlap with application controls as well. This is for folks or businesses that do software development or are outsourcing that and, and subcontracting a provider to perform software development for them. You want to make sure that in this document, you've articulated the separated environments, that, that there are controls in place from, from uh, you know, uh, development uh, to test, regression testing, blah, 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 to, to, you know, to QA environments and then to production, and, and then the testing within them you know, uh, testing, um, unit testing, integration testing, regression testing, uh, UAT with user acceptance testing. And all these environments are, are, and the style of coding is, is laid out as well as the biggest one, which is moving code uh, before it can move into production. It must go through authorization steps. And if I'm a developer, I should not be the guy who can commit that code to production. So those controls are huge. Those controls we audit uh, and, and most organizations are required to audit those. The last sort of control included in that too would be sort of that uh, code review. A lot of folks do peer reviews, one auditor or one rather developer might do the code and then the other developer would review it and then it would move through that workflow until a separate entity commits that code to production. Big, big item. Uh, last area on this slide, application controls, a lot of overlap. But here we're looking at, if you think of any, any system, think about, let's pick like a general ledger system, maybe it's cloud-based. So, we're, well, let's look at the, where it's living. It's living in the cloud. What are the controls around that? Do they have an independent audit that says, you know, that this service organization has appropriate physical and logical controls to govern my application? Um, you know, and so I'd ask us for a SOC 2 type 2 service organization audit that would speak to the environment but also that's just the hosting of it now what do we got we've got an application that's running what kind of access into that application do we have do we feed files into it also what does it do what kind of crunching of numbers is there integrity of data guaranteed do we have any any assessment of that and the code that it, you know who developed the code is it homegrown is it off the shelf has it ever been audited and and you know what are the um logging capabilities and auditing capabilities does it you know if errors occur do we log these things securely and then Lastly, output, what do we do? Is it hard copy output, reporting output? Does it feed another system perhaps? So we're looking at all facets, what goes into it, what it does, what comes out of it and where it lives. And then is it patched, uh, you know, is the application itself patched and the platform it runs on? So a lot of, a lot of fun stuff there too. <clears throat> all right, control weaknesses. Well, we talked about controls. What if they don't work, right? We got that locked door. And then you reach up there before hours and you figure the door's gonna be locked before you get there and the thing swings wide open. Lack of properly functioning controls 
are considered control weaknesses, which is another word for another term for a risk. So risk, you know, a, a risk exists when a control does not function properly. And, uh, um, you know, there's a little bit more we're going to go on to display, you know, kind of exa uh, exemplify that. But basically, the risk is not that, you know, in, in an example uh, of a control, if I have a control in place, you know, um, uh, for like, say, um, an application, you know, maybe user access into it. If the control was going to be that it had to be uppercase and lowercase, however, my program wasn't done properly and, and it didn't require strong, strong password access, uh, you know, that, that control uh, is not in place properly. And I can just put in one character password and, and later result in a compromise. But, you know, the, the risk is, is not so much that, you know, the, uh, the coding wasn't done right. The risk is unauthorized access into a system. It's not that I programmed it improperly. That's a control failure, a control weakness, but the actual risk with it, the risk is that someone could gain unauthorized access into that system and the confidential information, perhaps that, that runs through that. Big, big item, big differences, and we'll give you a better example down the road. So we put these controls in place to mitigate or remediate risks. You know, the access to a building we talked about, to system, same kind of thing. The thought is, let's put stuff in our environment to protect the stuff that we do so we can keep doing business and stay, stay in business, right? Um, so we, we can use several controls, you know, sometimes it's not just one control that meets, uh, you know, that mitigates the risks uh, appropriately. But when you talk about like I used to work in a banking environment and even just gaining physical access to the building, it wasn't one control. We had a locked door. We had an alarm. We even have one of those silly things when you leave where it has the colors that show the height of the person by the doorway. You know, it's a, that is a control. It's a small control, albeit a tall counter so they can't just reach over. That's a control. Uh, die packs, a control, ambush alarm, that's a control. The cash drawers in the lock drawer, that's control. In, in, in the beginning of the day, they're all in a vault somewhere. So all these things, these aggregate of controls uh, make that environment uh, less risky. So uh, the other thing is, what if we can't meet a control, right? What if, and we've dealt with, I've been around for a while. Uh, one of the guys gave my resume a little bit. I've been around for quite a while. I've been doing this for a number of years and we still deal with legacy systems. These are older systems that don't, you know, don't have all the bells and whistles of these newer systems. Um, in some cases, that's a good thing. There's less risk on an older platform, like a Unix platform versus a Windows platform. But but some of these things, they just don't have the, the requirement or the, the capabilities to do some of these other things. And, and so we're forced to say, well, how can we protect this particular system that doesn't, you know, allow strong passwords? Maybe it was coded 100 years ago when the thing was, you know, four, four characters or some foolish thing. You know, well, maybe we can put other monitoring tools in place, sort of a detective control, like to monitor it. Or maybe we can also have it physically in an environment and put extra perimeters around it, whether it's through another uh, separated um, a subnet that is um, has a perimeter firewall around it, uh, whatever, things like that. So these this aggregate of controls and, and the monitoring of it, these all add up to be compensating controls that will now bring that risk back down to reasonable levels. And the last element on this one is, you know, what is our goal? And I just said it, it's really to reduce risk to reasonable levels. We can get out here and we can, you know, we, we I have clients that try to do this. Like, hey, I want to, I work my way through the maturity model of, of these controls. And I want to be a five. One is ad hoc. Five is you're awesome. Five is also, you might be a little crazy because you want to shoot for five. Everybody does. But at the end of the day, the cost to get to a five, you need to assess that. You need to look at the, the cost versus value evaluation there. And, and maybe it doesn't make such, maybe a four is good enough, right? We have good reasonable controls in place and it didn't cost us, you know, an, uh, too much money to get there. And we have reasonable controls in, in place and we have a solid uh, security posture. That That's excellent. Maybe it is a five, but, but typically it's not. And, and a four is good. Yeah, but that last point is so huge to, uh, you know, to re reduce to reasonable levels, right? Because there's never going to be no risk, right? Something can always happen. Um, so it's just getting it to that level, um, you, know, you know, that you as an organization can tolerate. And that also puts you in line with um, complying with, you know, any uh, laws or regulations or any frameworks that, you know, you may need to, to be in compliance with um, for your organization. So it's really just getting it to that reasonable level. Um, and then just to kind of jump back to the aggregate of controls, um, that's another huge, huge one as well, because, um, you know, controls working together is kind of where, uh, you know, it'll be at its strongest, um, right? So, you know, having all like a locked door and, and cameras and alarms and all the things that Jerry had just pointed out, all working as one to kind of, you know, help control your physical environment as a whole, 
um, is is really huge, and and that becomes more powerful the more controls you have in place in that in that regard. Risk analysis. Well, listen, this is uh, this is an important one, right? Because no two risks are the same. No two controls may, may you know are are typically the same in the sense that you know I, I can have an entire control environment, and there may be hundreds of controls buried throughout my my big strong policy set. Uh, however, you know a control that protects the perimeter of my environment, like a firewall, things of that nature, you know, are more important potentially than a control like, oh, I, I maybe I, I do ongoing security awareness training and maybe I didn't do, uh, you know, uh, or acknowledgement of policies. Maybe I didn't have somebody sign off or some of those. So that control wasn't working properly. That one there, while it's a weakness because you, your policy says you'll, you'll sign off on all employees annually will acknowledge policies exist, da, 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 da. that's important. Don't get me wrong. But is it as important? as the lack of a firewall that, that protects my, my pr private network where my database exists? Absolutely not. So these, these are different controls. And like, likewise, when you assess a control, you're looking at that kind of thing. Essentially, you need to determine the severity of it, right? What's the probability of a negative occurrence happening? And then if that does occur, what would, uh, what would be the impact? So what you're reading there in bolts two and three, are a little bit fluffy. I, I, I always like black and white. Unfortunately, we do have shades of gray in here a little bit and, and it's assessment. It's the assessment and the maturity of, of number one, uh, when, you, when you have auditors that come in that are all seasoned and have experience, that, that is huge, that's gold. The, the other aspect, so, so we're drawing always on our, uh, our experience. We're drawing on our education, our certifications, things like that to, to, uh, uh, to determine what we believe the probability of it going sideways based on statistical information. And then if it did, what would be the impact on your business? You know, should that control be, be compromised? You know, so, it's, so, you know, it's that product which equals the risk level. And what we do in our assessments and folks do it different ways. I've seen it. So probability we go, okay, it can be, you know, from one to three, you know, and the impact one to three, three is horrible. One's good. You know, three, you know, three is horrible. One's good, good, good enough. Both of those have a one to three, rating. So a product of a nine, you know, three probability, that's a high probability and a high impact three times three is nine. That's the highest risk level going. Three times two is a six or, or two times three is a six. That's a medium, you know, as you work your way through the products of it, so one times one's a low risk. So my point is don't get nutty about, oh, because I've seen some one to 10, right? What's the, what's the difference between a seven and a six or a seven and an eight? You know, the, at the end of the day, it's more about what one risk level is relative to another. You can go on a one to 10, one to three, one to five, whatever you want scale, know what's more risky than the other thing. And then sort those to the top, find out which ones are the most, present the most risk to your environment. Yeah, that's great. And just another point there as well is, you know, kind of using that that system where you're kind of rating, rating the, uh, the risk level kind of, um, you know, assist organizations in, in determining where they want to prioritize their efforts, right? So if you get a high risk rating on, in a certain area, obviously you want to, you know, focus your attention to remediate that area first before you, um, you know, start to tackle some of those uh, lower level risk areas. So when we're putting, when we're putting these slides together, <laughs> so I see, I showed this in the past. What's, what, what's this about? <laughs> so I did this particular slide. I love this example because I, I get it. I, you know, I, when I talk to a lot of our clients, when we're working with them, uh, regardless of industry, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, when I talk to them about different risks and being able to potentially accept risks and taking risks, you're, you're also always doing a, an analysis, right? You're analyzing your, the probability and the impact of bad things occurring yourself all the time, whether you realize it or not. For example, in the banking world, I always say that it's a nice, easy one. I came to the banking world. When the, when the banks locked, like I told you earlier, locked up, alarmed, you know, security guard, cameras, you know, all that stuff in the drawers, die packs. It's in, a, it's in a cage inside of a locker in a bigger vault. That is low to no risk, right? The, the chances of someone compromising that vault is really, in this day and age, nothing, next to nothing. However, we take on that risk every day. We open up the door to the bank. We disarm the alarm. We, you know, we come on in, leave that door unlocked. We go in, we open the big vault door, we open the cage, we open the locker, we grab the key, we bring it out to the front line. You know, so we do all of these things, knowing, knowing that it was almost no risk before. And we start busting through these things and we do, and, and, and the risk is starting to go up. However, we mitigate that risk. We mitigate that risk through the, the other things we mentioned. This, 
you know, there's still the ambush alarm. There's a die pack. There's, you know, there's a higher counter. There may be a security guard. There's the, the height thing by the doorway. There's the cameras, alarms, you know, all that stuff. So you look at all of these things. And though we took it from a low, low risk environment, we made a business decision to, to, to move forward, take on a certain level of calculated risk, but we chose to mitigate those risks and, and bring them back to, again, more reasonable levels, albeit a little higher than when it was all locked up. And we had to do it. Why? To be in business, you have to, you know, it's fine, lock it all up and you're out of business. What does that do for you? So at the end of the day, we all make these decisions. You're rolled out of bed today and everybody's still working from home. So you, probably, you might not have been far from the bedroom still <laughs> when you're listening to this presentation. But end of the day, you, you calculate your risk in your own life. This is no different. So different terms kind of leads nicely into it. So these are terms, a lot of times I see these in the war, like we do all verticals, like I mentioned, and, and in some environments, they don't even know what any of these are. In the banking world, SEC, all these folks are very versed on this stuff. It's not very, very complicated. You're looking at inherent risk. Inherent risk, like it reads here, it's the amount of risk uh, that exists without putting controls in place, right? What's, you know, I'm putting something in place, whether it's logically on a system or physically in an environment, you know, what's, what's the risk before I try to start protecting it? You know, that's the, that's sort of the inherent risk comes with it, comes with the territory, right? Then residual risk is okay. I see what that risk presented, you know, kind of comes with the territory. I'm going to put some controls around it. Cause I went to Pat and Jerry's presentation. I realized I want these controls. And I know they belong in my policies. So I'm going to put them in there. And I'm going to have a nice security program, not just a policy, because Jerry said, I'm going to take these policies, put some procedures around them. I'm going to educate people. I'm going to monitor it. Now I have a program. That's what he said in this presentation. So anyway, the residual risk is what's left after you put these wonderful controls in place. I get a little risk maybe left over. It might be reasonable risk. That's our goal. You don't really want to stop until you get it to a reasonable level. Then you get a couple of other things here, a little bit related, but again, often in the banking world. You know, they're like, what's your risk appetite? You're like, well, nobody really wants it, you know, has a taste for risk. But at the end of the day, if you're a business owner or, or in management and man man managing a budget, your risk appetite is essentially your desired level of risk that you feel like you'll take, right, to, to achieve your objective. Let me put it in other words. In other words, it's idea like, look, I could put in, you know, this vault's good, but I can buy the best vault, this and that, put it, and put it in Fort Knox. Now it's going to cost me, you know, 10 times what I had before. What I had before, by the way, brought me down to reasonable risk, but I can take it from that control, you know, maturity model of four. I can take it to that five and, and spend all that money. What's my return on my investment? How about nothing? How good is that going to be if I keep taking that approach and I'm out of business because I burned my budget and blew over? So you want to balance. It's like buying insurance for yourself. You got to get your own risk appetite for that, right? You don't want to overpurchase. You don't want to underpurchase. Find what's right for you that makes sense. Same thing here. The tolerance, okay, so I, I have my appetite. I've got my risk environment set up. The tolerance, tolerance is a plus or minus tolerance. What am I going to allow? What's the variance you know, of the outcome, right? It's like, oh, I'll allow it to be a little bit, you know, I can allow it to be off a little bit. I estimate it to have certain risk level. I can have a little bit of error there, plus or minus. That's sort of the tolerance. Pat, did I lose you? Nope, you're, we're on the next slide here, risk acceptance. Oh, dude, it looks the same. Ha, funny. <laughs> So we got four more exciting terms, and this is a good one. These are also not always financial, but they're they're so good in, in terms of being, uh, you know, controlled and ready to rock on these things. In the sense that there's um, the, the terms are good, uh, but they they do have a regulated process. For example, the risk acceptance. If I'm going through in the financial industry and auditing, and it could be other industries that like are also on top of things. But I go in there and, and I audit them. I say, look, uh, you've got a control weakness here. You know, there's, you know, there's a, a low to medium level risk with this physical control, whatever it is, doesn't matter. And they say, yeah, you know what though? But um, uh, the cost for me to remediate that risk, you know, putting in the new super duper lock, you know, yeah, it was a low risk. But if I put this extra lock in, I don't think it buys me much, right? My, my risk analysis sort of says, look, it's not much risk that was there. There's not much they could ever get if they got in here anyway. So, so it's, it's reasonable. I'm going to accept that risk. And they literally, uh, you know, say that within the audit, right? So, and we'll cover a little bit of differences in the way you approach this, whether it's an audit risk assessment or something else, but that's essentially what it is. It's like, yeah, I'm going to accept that risk. And the auditor is like, what? Yeah. So that's, that's really what happens. Risk transfer is a layup. What that is, is very simple. It's kind of like 
Think about insurance, right? So there's a risk involved in what we're doing here. We see it all, all uh, a lot today. And I hope the folks on the phone, if you're working whatever verticals you're working in, that you're considering at least cybersecurity insurance. We don't have anything to do with it, but we see it, we recommend it. And the reason why uh, we recommend it is because it helps transfer certain risk. You all have it if you're in the banking world and other industries relative to disaster recovery, you know, having hot sites, warm sites, and cold sites, where you pay money for space that is, you know, in varying degrees of readiness should, should an interruption to business occur. So that's that transferring of the risk that's involved. And, and, and then God forbid, if, if you never need to call on it, at least you know it's there. It's, it's insurance-based. Now, the risk register, I love this one. And this is an important one. I don't care where you come from. This one's great. Why? I go through all the time and money to either self-assess or have an audit or risk assessment performed. And I have a few findings. I have a couple things we need to tweak. You know, we thought we were perfect, but we got a few things here. Compass came in and, and really interrogated our environment, pointed out some things, gave me that wonderful risk level they talked about. I know what they mean relative to each other. So it has real value. They've even provided remediation direction. So I know what to do to fix it. Now I'm going to take that stuff. It doesn't die there. It doesn't end there. It starts there. Now I take those control weaknesses, those risks that were identified in that report. I move them over to, I don't care, a spreadsheet, whatever you want to do. Put them in a spreadsheet. It's nice because you can sort it. So I put them all in there. And over time, you know, maybe, maybe somebody ran a vulnerability assessment against my environment and there was a couple of risks. I'm going to pull those out and I'm going to put them in the same register. And this register is a way of us keeping all of our, our control weaknesses, all of our risks in front of us in one place. I'm going to report this to my security committee, my management, maybe if I'm part of a, a financial organization to the audit committee, to the board of directors. This is where we are today based on the independent audits or assessments that were performed. Here's where we, what we found for the risk level. I'm going to sort it highest to lowest because those are the ones I'm going to put my dollars on first, getting those high risks addressed before the lower ones. I'm going to put an owner next to it because I I'm big on project management and I want to know who's going to do what and when I'm going to get a date out there. When is this going to be fixed? This is huge. So then you go ahead and, and you have that plan. It's an internal plan and the audit committee loves you. Related to that, the last bullet, management response. When we perform an audit or an, an independent audit firm performs an IT audit on your environment, whether it's an application, general controls, whatever audit. But if they're auditing something there's, and there's a, a control weakness found, Management can, you know, management in an audit should respond. It's it's respect. It's expected. It's a requirement, sort of in the banking industry. Like, here's a control weakness. This this thing, this physical control. Like I said in my first example, you know, wasn't um, wasn't enough to snuff. Right? It was a, it was a low to medium finding I put in there, and the management response may be, "Hey, I'm going to use bullet number one on this slide. I'm going to accept this risk. The cost of implementing a control for this particular physical thing we feel is unreasonable and doesn't provide us enough." You know, you know the, the the value isn't there, and the risk is so low that even if they got in, they wouldn't be able to exploit it. And this is our logical management response, and it's documented in the audit. Now the audit is finalized, and there it goes. One final note before I turn it over to Pat, or we slide forward, is in the banking world, when you provide these management responses, these are a matter of record. That means when the auditors come back in, whether it's the same in the banking world, examiners, whether it's federal or state. Or if you're in another industry and I go in, I say, let me see your previous audits. We're looking at this. And I look at one and I get this audit and it says, yeah, some control weaknesses. This physical control wasn't up to snuff. They, I see their management response says, yeah, we're going to take care of that. Uh, Jerry's going to fix that thing by the end of the month, whatever, whatever. And now I look at this. Now it's six months later. And the auditing firm looks at it and says, well, did they fix that? They said he was going to fix it in six months. It's a year later. What's going on? And it's still not fixed. That is a major, major issue. That is a big problem. It's like lying to the IRS. You don't want to get caught doing it. So, so here's your deal. When you say you're going to do it, do it. Very simple. You put your management response in there. They're going to go to that. I guarantee this. That's the first place they look. Did you do what I said? You told me you'd do this. I took it on good faith. You better have done it before we come back. Yeah, no, that's great. And then just regarding the first point as well, uh, talking about risk acceptance, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're running a business, right? And, and it has to make sense. And, and kind of as Jerry talked about before, it's that kind of that cost benefit analysis of, um, you know, does the risk, is there a high probability that this risk, uh, you know, can be compromised? Um, maybe if not, then, you know, maybe choose to accept it, right? So at the end of the day, you know, you really got to weigh that out. Um, because there's never going to be no risk, you know, as we said before. So it's really just a matter of, you know, how much risk tolerance uh, can you take or, or risk acceptance can you, can you take? So. 
this is my favorite example. So, so over the years, teaching our audit staff, when we bring folks on, you know, and, and we go through and kind of, we want, we want a repeatable process, even for us when we perform audits. So we educate the staff on it. I've spoken at different venues on this subject and you folks get the benefit of this today. So, so for anybody who's ever heard me speak before, they're like, hey, use that example one other time. I love it. You know, it, it's kind of like sort of a test, right? What's a control? And, and normally in a conference room before this crazy COVID stuff, I'd be able to ask, what's the control? We talk about all oh, the control in this picture. So let's say this is the entrance to my, my um, I don't know, my bank, whatever. The control is the lock, correct. The lock is the control. You know, how do you test the control? You try the door, good. What's the risk? It's not that the door is unlocked. It's, it's not, you know, uh, that um, there was no lock. It, it, the, the risk is that someone will gain unauthorized access. And, and so if the door is unlocked, i.e. I tested that control and I was able to gain access, it is unauthorized access, but that's not the complete risk. Gaining unauthorized access, what it costs you? Nothing. But what if I gain unauthorized access to confidential information? Now there's, there's your full-blown risk right there. That's my risk statement. It's not that the door doesn't lock doesn't exist. Hey, you saved a couple bucks. You don't have a lock on a door. It didn't cost you anything. However, I gain unauthorized access to a restricted area, and now I have access to confidential information. That is the risk. So that's a control weakness because the lock didn't either work or wasn't locked. The control lived in our policy set, we, we, you know, and it's part of our security program. So we had policies. We even had procedures on how we locked the door. We trained our staff. Hey, folks, lock the door. See this policy? Go ahead and acknowledge that annually. Sign off that you know the rules to the game. And that this is part of our, and we'll monitor it all the time, but this is part of our program. And, and, and yet here we are, broken control. Someone didn't lock the door. The, law, the door itself was, uh, was, was broken or uh, didn't lock. And I was able to gain authorized access to confidential information. There's my, my, my risk. I will remediate this risk, which is otherwise known as a control weakness. I'm going to, if the lock was broken, I'm going to replace it. If the, if it was just poor training, I'm going to, maybe I just need to retrain folks. Hey guys, when you leave, you do this. Here's a checklist. I want this signed every day. I'm putting another control in, you know, aggregating controls. We talked about that before. I'm going to add that to my policy. Hey, not only do we, my facility manager, when they leave the building, are they going to lock it at night? They're going to sign a checklist. They're going to check each item off, initial it, sign it at the end of the day. There's another control. It's a simple, silly little one, but guess what? It might tick their memory, and now they're going to do it. I might even put a monitoring thing in. Maybe I have a camera, an external camera I can check to make sure the person did it. So, so this is a way of, of kind of going back and forth with the terminology. It matters because when you get your audits done or your risk assessments done or the other terms I'm going to cover in a second, you're going to, you're going to need to know what a control is and what the real risk is. And I guarantee you when you read a lot of these, these reports, they're going, to be, they're going to misspeak. They're going to say the risk is the doors unlocked. That is not the risk. The risk is unauthorized access to confidential information. That's the risk. Anything else, Pat? Uh, no, but just in, in terms of the uh, testing of a control, you know, this, the second bullet point here, uh, how do you test a control, right? So um, in this case, you know, jiggle the doorknob, right? And, and it's that simple um, to test whether the door is locked or not. But then there may be other cases, you know, if you want to test, um, you know, user access rights for, for an example here, um, you know, doing a full um, user access review, right? That may take a lot longer and is a lot more complex than than just jiggling a, a door handle. But um, it's kind of that wide variety of, of all the different controls that could be implemented um, and then the appropriate way of, of testing them. Here's our terms again, right? All our, our crazy terms throughout these. And we are gonna break those down succinctly and you will leave here. I'm gonna give you a, a hint. IT audit on this screen of all these, the, an IT audit of these uh, terms out here is the most complex of all of them. And complex means cost more time, which is more money, more involvement by your staff too, though, right? So as we perform these different functions, and you're going to see what's involved in each one of these, and uh, and there's others I'm sure you've seen you've seen out there. But but what you'll leave today with is a clear understanding of kind of what's involved in an audit relative to what's involved in a risk assessment or a review, and 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 why they're different in terms of the steps, and why they're different or how they're different, uh, and and why they charge you maybe more money to have an IT audit performed versus a risk assessment or a health check or gap analysis. So in every case, whether it's any of those terms that I had in the last slide, what are we doing? We are assessing the client's control environment. We all know what control is now to something. What are we, what are we assessing them to? Well, we can assess them to 
a law. Hey, let's see, uh, maybe you are in the healthcare industry, you're a covered entity. So you're governed by HIPAA or high tech. And so you can, we're going to go through and based on what the client's looking for, we will assess you to the law of HIPAA, the security and privacy rules of HIPAA. There's a bunch of do's and don'ts and what you should do. And we're going to look at a lot of evidence. So, so that might be something. We might assess you to the PCI standard. That's a standard. It's not a law. It's not a regulation. It is a standard. It's put out by the payment card brands. And as a QSA, we come in, we perform an audit to your environment to that standard. You may be audited to a framework. I may not be governed by a lot of different entities. Maybe I don't have payment card information flowing through my environment. I'm not in the healthcare industry in any respect. Maybe I'm running manufacturing and I don't have any PII, personally identifiable information or confidential information anywhere. You know, maybe I just want to be audited to a particular standard. So I have at least a general sense, you know, wh whether it's an ISO standard or COVID or there's a lot of frameworks out there. So, so these frameworks ISO, uh, COVID, and, and uh, others through NIST and stuff. We, we audit to these frameworks all the time so folks can know where they are relative to the, where they need to be uh, as it relates to the framework. General best practices, similar to the previous one in a sense, in the sense that, well, you know, what, what are the, what's the best practices for password length? What's the best practices for this or for scanning and that and pen testing and that, 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 that. So we, we can assess you to those. And those are evolving. Many of these things are, but best practices. Uh, a little bit more dynamic as, as the world unfolds. And lastly, and there's probably a couple more, but, but essentially, hey, I can audit you to your own policies. I always give an example of this one because folks, it's very interesting. One of the controls that we find or policies that have controls in them, it might be a, a record retention policy. I have certain information that I'm going to retain. Maybe the state that you're in says this must be retained for three years. You may say as an owner or legal staff within this business that we want to retain it for five years. That's cool. You can do that. You can't do less than three because it's against the law, but you can do more than three. So when I come in as an auditor, if you only have three, I'm going to write you up. Now you abided by the law. Absolutely. But not the law of your business, your policies. If you say you're going to do it, you got to do it. So, so those are, that's low hanging fruit. When your policies say stuff, got to make sure you're doing it and your staff knows to do it, to do it as well. So we're testing the design of the controls, and we know those live within the policies. And then we're testing the operating effectiveness. So the design, hey, it looks well, like I always joke about going into an office and it, wow, I read the policy, it says, yeah, they're gonna have a you know, receptionist, I'll be escorted, I'll get a badge, log in, there's cameras, locked door, she has to buzz me in, the whole nine. And then I get there, the door's open, the camera's swinging from the top, the receptionist running off selling Avon to somebody, and there's nobody there and I'm walking around everywhere I want. That's the operating effectiveness or lack thereof. So that's kind of a pretty uh, broad or, or, or you know example or have one that <laughs> hopefully magnifies it. So now we're going to run through these last few in our home stretch. We got about 14 minutes and then we'll take some questions, plus or minus 14. But so we look at them and I'm going to cover the first two because they're the title of this whole thing. So the risk assessment. It, it, it's a it, you know you're going to, first thing you do is you're going to set your assessment plan. That's where you say okay. Jerry mentioned about frameworks and laws. What am I assessing to? Let's pick that first. Oh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in the healthcare industry. I want to I go through a HIPAA risk assessment. Great. Let me grab the security rule and privacy rule. Do I want to do both or one? Let's set the scope. So now I've, I've chosen the law of HIPAA. I've chosen the, maybe just the security rule. And then I'm going to go through and I'm say, what would I look at? Well, it says here in one of the items, I need to have policies. I need to have, you know, backups to my critical systems. Do I have backups? You know, so I'm, I'm going to request as an auditor of an environment like this, I'm going to request evidence like that. Your policy set, your evidence of last audit, you know, education on security awareness and, and HIPAA training. Da, 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 da. So I ask for a bunch of different things. That's evidence that I'm requesting. I'm going to review that. And then if anything's missing, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a last chance. Hey, do you have these things? I haven't been provided them. If I haven't been provided them, they don't exist. That's a finding. So then I'm going to go through and perform interviews. I'm going to do the old, for the old folks on the line, the Columbo thing. You know, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm not trying to trip you up per se, but I am trying to see if you really do what the control statements in your policies say. They say you escort people, put badges on, and I'm going to talk through that with you. And I'm going to have that one last question that, that you may stumble on, or you're, and I'm going to match what you say with what your colleagues say. And I am going to see if you're truly doing what your policies say and then move through. And then lastly, I'll walk through uh, perform a walkthrough. It's a physical looking around of the environment, you know, you know, locked doors, you know, the vaults there, it's locked, good, that door's closed, good, dot, 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 I walk around. And then lastly, I 
draft the report, and I do an exit assessment. What is that? I'm going to go through. I'm going to provide with you sort of the draft of the risk assessment. Hey, folks, here's what we have. And it's an opportunity for us to agree. Yep, these things aren't in place. Or no, wait a minute, we have that. And Betty just didn't know it existed. Let me go get that for you. Ah, here's, here's additional evidence. And I'm going to modify that assessment to properly read because I have new evidence that wasn't provided that proves it was in place throughout the, the assessment. And then the finding, the final report comes out and includes the risks. It includes the level of each risk because we know no two risks are alike. And then what you should do to fix any control weaknesses uh, in there. Yep, and I just want to point out, um, you'll see in the next slide as well, when we talk about IT audits, um, but it's really just the, the level of deep dive that, that differentiates the two, right? So in a risk assessment, you know, you're not diving as deep into the, the evidence and some of the observations and uh, the interviews, whereas um, in an audit, you know, we, we need to see evidence of, of everything, right? And we need to match up that evidence with the interviews, um, whereas a risk assessment, you know, if we perform an interview and, and we ask questions and whatnot and, and um you know, we can sometimes take that at face value, whereas an audit, we, we must have evidence of it, we must have it documented, um, and we must say that, through, you know, within the report it, itself as well. So we'll kind of talk one about that. Point. Pat, one good point on that too. Yeah. Think about what you, Pat just said too. We, we may take it and for a risk assessment, you know, hey, they said we do this or that, but make no bones about it. We are, in, both, in all cases, maintaining audit or assessment work papers where, you know, I interviewed Bill Smith and Bill said we do this or don't do that. On this day and time, when I interviewed Bill Smith, this is what he said. Bill wants to lie. Bill's putting his name on the line. I'm putting in there that this is performed or not. If someone says, hey, who the heck told you that? I'll tell you at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Bill said this and this and this when we were in that room when I interviewed him. So so there's a whole in, in, you know process that we go through and we have to maintain as, as auditors. And like Pat said, and then this is the... Uh, uh, you know, this is the, the Grand Prix. This is the, the Mercedes Benz of all. This is the big, big top. This is the big one. It includes all of, uh, you know, what was in a risk assessment and then those two green areas. And I probably should have highlighted the observations as well as a third area that's a little bit different. So, so we set the audit plan the same, right? What's in scope? You know, what controls my testing? How am I going to test those? And then it literally is a whole plan mapped out. And then literally I go out and execute. So the plan says test the control by going to the door before uh, nine o'clock and after five o'clock, trying the door, then do this, then do this. Then do this. So it's literally uh, the, the hardest part of the audit is setting the scope and the audit plan is, you know, the, the scope is part of the audit plan, but setting that documenting the controls that will be tested, how they will be tested and who I'm going to speak to to test them, the owner, the control owner. And now you just play, you know, testing is easy. Just run through it um, and maintain the evidence. So then here you go. You're requesting all that evidence, just like with the, uh, with the risk assessment, but the third bullet in the evidence that we're requesting, we're gonna look for samples. And depending on the type of audit, we may be looking for it point in time, meaning, hey, give me some samples from today or last 30 days. Some audits like SOC 2 Tech 2 audits, things like that, uh, we may be auditing a period of time. It's not only do we need to make sure that door, that door was locked in April, but we need to make sure it was locked in March and back in February, you know, so we're, we may be auditing you over time, depending on what the control is and what's what the risk is and things of that nature. So, so we're looking at, over time, potentially, we're looking at sample sizes. We have we have ten systems. If all ten systems are different, then I have to look at ten systems. If all ten systems are cookie cutter, maybe I look at twenty percent of them, grab two of them, depending on what's on those systems. You have to ask a few more questions, but that's really sort of the simplistic of, approach to it. But the big difference: samples, deeper dive, like Pat said on the last slide. We're doing interviews, but maybe we're going to do more interviews. I'm going to not only talk to you know, the, the manager or supervisor, but I may speak to three other people in the department. So that's deeper. Observations. I, want, I, I read about it. I saw the controls that, as evidence that were provided, some samples. Now I want to see you do it right in front of me. Go ahead, log in. Let me see this. And let me screen share. We're all, we're all good at that now, thanks to COVID-19. Let's do some screen sharing, you know, that kind of thing. And then the walkthrough today may or may not be physical. I may have someone go through with the camera, even though I've done that before. So at the end of the day, it's a lot deeper, Three, three things really called out was the sampling, the observations a lot more, and then the uh, the exit audit, similar to the previous one. Um, in, instead, you know, you're going through the same process though, right? It's a deeper uh, dive. We're sharing control weaknesses. And last one below, I'm soliciting management responses for findings, and they're going to do it. And one of the things in my earlier, earlier days, I learned, and I didn't realize they did this, but literally when, when you provide a management response, and I know in the banking industry for sure, you may say, yeah, we're going to accept that risk. The auditor can say, yeah, and they can rebuttal. So the auditors 
gave you the finding. Hey, here's the control we tested. Here's what we found. Here's the level of risk we see. And here's what you need to do to fix it. You can go, yeah, we don't think so. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and accept that risk. We have a, we're, we're hungry. We have a big risk appetite. And then I can come back and say, yeah, I don't think so. And I get the last word. And it stays there as a matter of record. Subsequent examiners and auditors are going to come in looking at that work. And it doesn't always look good if you're going and you're pushing back. Unless you have a good defensible position, have at it. And then last, uh, last few items here, you know, providing that final audit report, it, it provides typically an overall opinion, right? So we've looked at these things, identified the risks and the levels and what needs to be done for remediation, but we'll also give you an overall opinion. In our opinion, based on the controls tested in the environment, the overall environment's good. It's not, it's not a binary. Like we are qualified security assessors for PCI. And when we go and do those, it's binary. You go through 300 controls being tested. If you got one failure, it is fail. It's that simple. So that's, crazy i know but at the end of the day that's how that works in this world in a typical audit world that's not the case um that's specific to to pci these uh rest of the terms are going to fly much more smoothly and we're going to be right on at two o'clock as we promised you so a review yeah we're gonna, what, are we, what are we reviewing what, what's in scope what are we looking at huh? you review this app can you review access controls to this system you know whatever and then based on what you want to review we're going to ask for some things like, oh, access reviews to our system. Like Pat gave an example. What would that entail? Let me see. What's the system? You know, who are the, give me a print, not a typed up Word document, but an export or screen print of who the elevated or administrators are on the system. And then who are the other users and what level uh, of, of access they have. I'm going to get a list from HR to see that there's still work here. And, I'm, and I might also interview managers and see, hey, who granted authorization for them to have that level of administrative access? Is there a change control process is there you know what's in place to govern and control access to that system that would be my access review and then um you know you go through and, and sometimes because it's just a review it might be here here's a questionnaire tell me what you know what you do blah blah, blah. you know and it, might, it might ask certain questions yes or no is there encryption yes or no is it is, there, is it accessible public facing over a website yes or no so we can assess you know, at a high level, the level of risk, uh, inherent risk the system might have even before controls are applied. And then maybe I might do an interview to kind of bring some of the points home, but it would be real, real high level and provide that review report. Self-assessment, the weakest of them all. <laughs> and so here you go. Hey, go ahead and tell me how good you are. And I get these things and, and, I, and I read a lot of these. We get a lot of these in the PCI world, uh, credit card world where we do um, that work. And they self-assess, they fill out these forms and it's yes, no, yes, no, yes. You know, and a lot of folks are just like, yes, 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 yes. Then I say, and I look at some of this stuff and if I'm asked to evaluate these, I say, let me see this and this and this. And it's like, boom, the head explodes. So it's easy to check a yes box, it really is. But to stand up and prove it, Dangerous. So when you're receiving these as evidence of maybe a, a vendor that you're looking at and you provide a questionnaire for a vendor and they self-assess themselves, take that with a grain of salt. Look at that. Maybe ask for a little bit more evidence than just accepting, especially if it's a high risk system, something that has either PII of your clients or, or you know, uh, dollars and cents are being passed, financial system of sorts, whatever. Just, just take it with a grain of salt because it is a self-assessment. So they, were, they may even have to provide it to a governing body or a third party, like a vendor management program request, or in the example of PCI, you have to send it to, to the acquiring bank as evidence that they're compliant. Yeah, that's a great point. Because I, I actually, just as an example, I just went through something like that with a, with a client where they had previously been doing a self-assessment questionnaire for, for PCI. And then um, we were going to be doing theirs for, for this year. And uh, when I asked for, for some of the items that would be needed for the self-assessment questionnaire that they attested to last year, they, they weren't able to provide them. So it, it can get a little bit dicey, as Jerry said, with some of these uh, self-assessment questionnaires and, and whatnot. So really, um, you know, be sure you're doing your due diligence as it is the, the weakest one of all, as he, he pointed out. So. Then you get your gap analysis, similar to a review. Some people may even want to call it a risk assessment, but you don't, it, there's no risk implied here. There's no, you may say the control, you know, here's what the control is and there's a gap because it's missing, but you, you typically wouldn't put a risk analysis. Or you wouldn't apply a risk analysis to it and calculate the level of risk. You may not even provide remediation. That's, that's not implied. The gap is, hey, here's where I am. Maybe I still pick out my control, determine what I'm reviewing. 
Maybe I'm going to go to, I don't know, COVID framework, COVID-5, look at the control uh, about availability, of, you know, system availability. And, uh, and I prove they, you know, I'm, I'm gap, I'm trying to gap. No, we have no plan. Uh, that's a, that's a finding, you know? So I asked for evidence. There's nothing there. Maybe I, I found out through an interview or whatever question here, but anyway, at the end of the day, it just shows the gaps. Doesn't tell you what to do with it. Doesn't tell you how bad it is compared to something else. It is what it is. And the last one before we summarize and land right on exactly two o'clock is the health check, the weakest right next to right next to self-assessment. I might have been a little hard on self-assessment because health checks also kind of weak. And I might even say this is weaker. This is the same thing. What am I going to what am I looking at? It's kind of like a checklist often. Yeah, this is weaker. Let's all agree on that. This is weaker. And it's like, hey, do you got these things? Yeah, I got policies. We do we do quarterly scans. We do this. We do this. All right, good. I'll see you next quarter. That is weak. Yeah, uh, that's definitely worse. And then I might even put a report. I might not. See, it's just, and it goes nowhere. So that is definitely the weakest of them all. And when I wrote this, that's why I put it last. So I, I misspoke. <laughs> now let's bring it all home. What the heck did Jerry and Pat say? So first thing is ask yourself, who governs you, right? What, you know, what industry am I in? Who am I making, you know, do I deal with private information? So identify the laws and regs or standards that apply to me. And then, you know, grab a company. We do it. Lots of companies do it. Get somebody that you're comfortable with and certified, but also experience. I don't want to make green coming in my building and tell me, you know, looking at my environment, they don't even know what, what is what. So, so a little bit of gray hair helps get a little experience out there. Um, and then you're going through and, and if it's an audit, you want to make sure you're providing a management response, to any findings, grab those risks if any exist, sort them by severity, highest risk to lowest, put an owner and date to them and then move to remediate them in a timely fashion. And I bring you to two o'clock. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments on how great that was landing at exactly two o'clock? <laughs> so we got some questions? Wanna read them off to me or are you gonna make me kind of find where the question thing is? All right, I'll do that, I'm okay. Uh, we communicate risk coming out of a vendor, risk assessment via email response, follow-up, et cetera. We do not have a risk register. Any suggestions to encourage the business to follow up on open risk once a vendor has been approved or mission. Yeah, as part of your vendor management program, policy, procedure, monitoring, education, we go through and you and, and you get these vendor questionnaires back. Uh, you want to go through and uh, typically in the contracts that you engaged in uh, for these third-party uh, relationships, you, you want to make sure there's an SLA, a service level agreement. What does this vendor say they're going to do for me? And you, you want to make sure they have availability and security statements in there, privacy statements in there if it's applicable to what you do. And then follow up on those definitely risks should be followed up and you need to weigh, do I want to keep doing business with this vendor if they cannot provide me evidence that they are compliant and holding the standards that we have in our business? Um, some people want to talk about a little bit about between management, IT risk assessment, and IT risk assessment. Uh, led by by audit. So it could be an internal auditor performing these or an external auditor, more independence. But either way, the risk assessment, like I said, uh, is a little bit, a lot higher in the sense of, of evidence, right? A lot lighter. I don't ask for as much. I don't ask for those samples. I give you an example of 10 systems. Give me, if they're all the same, I only see one or two of them. If 10 are different, give me all 10. I want to look at config files, owners, updates, patching, everything, log files. I am tearing into this 10 times versus one or two times. Major difference, time-wise, cost-wise, it's much, much more involved, also much more valuable. So what are you looking for at when you perform an application audit? Good stuff. So an application audit, uh, I listed some of the facets of it, but we're looking at what goes into it, what it does, what comes out of it. Going into it might be a file feed, might be data entry by a, a person who has access to it, is it patched? What platform is it on? Meaning what operating system and hardware or is it in the cloud? What controls do they have? You know, and that kind of thing. And then are there controls within, if it's a financial system to govern, you know, ensure that uh, errors and error correctness is there, that there's error logging, that auditing is turned on and we can follow up uh, even detectively if something went sideways. Is there output? Is a hard copy who has access to it? Is a file feed to another system? All kinds of fun stuff with application audits. All right, all right. Uh, boom, boom, boom. And that I think is everything. Ah, please discuss and compare vulnerability assessments and penetration tests. All right, so, and, and early on, I saw these used and misused, and it kind of frustrated me because we offer both of these services, and they are dramatically different. So, so when, when someone says, can you come into our environment and perform, let's just say, an external vulnerability assessment, it's going to be an assessment on, say, our public-facing IP addresses, and there might be a handful of them uh, in your DMZ that I can get to uh, from the outside world, anywhere in the world. 
So I go in and I perform a vulnerability assessment. I'm looking at uh, vulnerabilities. I'm using hopefully a, a tool. We are, uh, we do a lot with Qualys. Uh, some folks use Rapid7. There's lots of products out there, but Qualys does a nice job and it has known a lot of a database full of updated known threats and vulnerabilities, things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, all these, you know, uh, known and many more uh, vulnerabilities, whether it's an application, you know, um, or, or, or that's older and there's part, pieces of it that didn't, you know, get uninstalled when an upgrade took place. This this will also look at security, like uh, uh, encryption, like TLS. There's, there's TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, .1, and 1.0 has been already compromised way back, not allowed in PCI and other areas. 1.1 uh, also uh, presents a bit of risk. We recommend 1.2, which is encryption level. So a vulnerability assessment is going to tell you what's what's out there. Penetration test says, okay, found all these vulnerability assessments. In fact, first thing I'm going to do is run that nmap to identify my nodes or my IPs and then my assets. And then I'm going to run my vulnerability assessment. And then I'm going to exploit those. I'm literally going to penetrate the or exploit those different uh, uh, vulnerabilities identified and many more. So we have a number of tools and our, our our security group, you know, will write their own scripts for different things, depending, we have other tools to complement what's out there, depending on the environment we're looking to, to attack. So very, very different, uh, but much more intensive. The pen test definitely needs to be coordinated with the client, certainly approved, of course, but, but coordinated because there's more of a risk that it could, it, because it's more invasive, it could cause a system to, to crash. So there's a bit of a risk, but it's unlikely. Um, last question I see here, what is an exit audit? I did touch on it a little bit. I mentioned even an exit assessment. We don't always do the assessment, but in an exit audit, that's definitely required when, you, when you're performing audits before you leave. It's, it's that kind of review. Remember, what, hey, here's where we're at. Because we always promise that when we get into an in, uh, engagement with our clients, when we perform, you know, uh, whether it's an assessment, risk assessment or an audit, that, that we're, we're guaranteeing you accuracy. We're not guaranteeing you're going to like the results. You know, look, they'll look nice, but, but they may not read well. You may not like the fact that there's a lot of risks here, but we guarantee it's accurate. And our, our last sort of gut check for that is the exit audit. Hey, folks, here's what we looked at, looked at when we started this engagement. These are the areas we told you we were going to look at. Well, we did that. Here are the risks we found. We were provided this evidence from your team. If some of it's missing, your team didn't provide it to us. Maybe you know of some of it that exists. Oh yeah, here it is. I've even had some with the audit, maybe a longer engagement and they've gone through and said, darn, that door is broken. And they even literally had the guy fix it while we were there. I will note that. Now the finding stays, I, I'll, I'll reduce the overall risk later, but I will note there was a risk of this when we were there, but it was remediated while we were still performing the audit. That's okay to say. So we, we ethically, honestly tell the situation as is the risk level. Then we move through now the risk level, residual risk is, is low, which is reasonable. I'll tell you some of the ones, you know, different ones we've seen with, um, you know, with, with the environments we've come in, some of the questions that have come up, um, you know, relative to the, you know, and it, it, again, this, this answer or what I'm about to say, framing it up has to do with the environment you're in. Some more regulated environments, there's, there's a whole dance, like the banking world that I told you about. There's a whole, now I don't just write the, I don't just write the audit, perform the exit audit and deliver it. I actually get up in front of the, you know, their audit committee present you know, where they're at uh, with, with the findings and, and, and share the risk register. One other note in the banking world, I, I recommend it in all worlds, but it's definitely required by the FFIC in the banking world. And that is that you also maintain sort of a three-year rolling audit plan. Audit plan is gonna go ahead and say, here's what we're gonna audit this year next year, year two, and year three. And it's a little bit flexible in the sense that, hey, we just, maybe business changed and we added a new system. Well, gosh, a new system means potential new risk. Why don't we add it to this year's audit plan? Maybe we'll move something out to the second year. But in, in a nutshell, very quickly, the first year, and, and, and uh, you, you wanna do this, you wanna put your higher risk items and have them recur every year, right? So I've got an internet-based system. It does financial transactions. That's a high, it has inherent high risk, right? The risk before I put controls around it. Now I put some great controls around it, so the risk is reasonable, but it came inherently high. It's a very important system to what we do. I'm gonna audit that every year. And then I've got some other systems or other areas that may be auditing a back office application. Well, there's physical controls around it already, and there's logical controls, less risky. It did well in the last audit. Maybe we'll move that out to once every three years. So you kind of move them around like that. Things that are very risky, maybe we do them every year. Things that are less risky, every other year. Things that, you know, that pop up, we can slide to the front. Some that are less risky, we move to the back. Common sense, in all cases, we update our audit committee 
and often we, we bring that same stuff to the board of directors. Hey folks, here's where you, you want to know how the, uh, the security is. You have a, a fiduciary responsibility. We want to share with you the, the security posture of your financial institution or your whatever business you're in. Here's where we're at. Here's what we did. Here's what we're going to do to fix those. Our risk register, look at this. They're all shrinking. One note on the risk register, if these things, as you're starting to make progress and you will, as you move through with an owner and a date, track to those internally. And as you complete them, move them to a, use Excel, it's really easy, but move, put another tab out there, right? Another worksheet within the workbook and the completed ones get moved out there. Those are a pat on the back. Those are the ones I hate. These were out there before, look at this. We closed the gap on those. We got two left, maybe four more came on from a pen test that was performed and boom, 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 you constantly, it is very dynamic. And it, it's your story of how you're doing as a security officer to, to, to main, make sure that we're keeping the controls in front of us and we're mitigating those risks to reasonable levels. We do get, uh, and I see another question that came up. We do get questions about security officers and what their role is. Some of our clients are very small. So we perform like virtual chief security officer roles for them rather than going out and hiring a security officer, for example. It's like, this is the new thing since sliced bread, I guess. We get pulled into, uh, and, and we do a lot of it now. We've got a whole group that handles uh, security assessments for organizations. Think about it. You don't have just one person you're hiring, you're hiring a whole uh, organization to support you and your business needs and your security needs. And so good way of staying up on it. And, and the other aspect of it is, you know, they don't have any benefits. <laughs> All right, last question. Uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, 210, not bad. If we complete an audit, send it to another department for completion and the department doesn't complete it, what's our responsibility to ensure we've covered ourselves? Well, the fact that you provided it to another department I don't know what industry we're talking about, but the point is, if I'm in, you know, in a business and I've, I've identified what the risks are, I've completed the audit, these are the findings, I make clear and copy. You know, email is wonderful because email is an automatic audit trail. I won't send anything through email, and I wouldn't send an audit report, by the way, unless it was encrypted, because it shows a control weakness. Anybody getting that, you're giving them a little bit of a roadmap to some of the problems we have in my business. So don't send it that way. But you may say to them, hey, folks, it's up on our secure drive. Here's where it is. There's six There's six, six risks in your area, Joe Schmo. Please take care of those. These are very high. The auditor identified them as, as high. So, so I need you to provide me, you know, your management response, maybe. Maybe your who's the owner and who's what day, when you think I'll have it ready by. Uh, and, and copy the right people. So within your organization and the politics that may exist, because they exist everywhere, whether we like it or not, you, you can have it nice and politely, subtly provide them a message, get the correspondence back or lack thereof. But at the end of the day, you provided them that message, you followed up and you've got a nice audit trail to show the world that you did the right thing. And that's how you ensure that you covered yourselves. 